extractive industries and coal mining in particular have been a particular focus of European industrial heritage initiatives and debates that centre on prominent post-industrial um, areas such as, such as Germany's region, amongst others. And of course, more recently, European oil industry has become an object of industrial heritage and a range of European institutions have been charged with the remit of archiving and displaying Europe's oil history. Alongside the corporate archives of companies such as Total, BP, Eni, and others, bodies such as Capturing the Energy in Scotland or the Norwegian Oil Archive have been established to collect and to archive relevant materials. While institutions, and these are the these are really the, the exhibitions I'm interested in today, institutions such as the Monumental Norwegian Petroleum Museum, Museum in Stavanger, Aberdeen's Maritime Museum, Vienna's Technical Museum offer visitors extensive interactive exhibits documenting the oil industry. Now, these are three museums that are varied in terms of scale, in terms of geographic location, in terms of temporal reach and underpinning collection, but there are commonalities, as I suggested at the outset here, in the structuring devices employed in the design of their oil and gas exhibitions, all of which are based precisely on principles of verticality, facilitating ways of subsurface seeing. In the Maritime Museum in Aberdeen, the Energy Exploration Exhibition, what we've got coming up here, um, the Energy Exploration Exhibition there, this is the one, um, is which opened in 2013, is organised around a three-storey tall uh, scale model of Murchison oil platform, ordering the display around the principle of drilling down from the surface of the North Sea into the seabed below. In the oil and gas exhibition in Vienna's Technical Museum, that's this one here, uh, refurbished in 2014, the oil pipeline is the central object running both over and underground. It functions as a manifestation then of the exhibition's underlying principle of making visible elements of fossil fuel infrastructure and culture that largely remain invisible in daily life. Visitors to the Technical Museum in Vienna are invited to, set, to descend below the surface and to follow the underground route of the pipeline or alternatively then to remain above the surface and to gaze upon the pipeline's underground location you can see there in the, in the image through the perspex panel there which is embedded in the floor of the exhibition space. In the Norwegian Petroleum Museum, this one here, um, situated in the waterfront in central Stavanger, an immersive exhibit casts visitors in the role of the diver having crossed a bridge from onshore to offshore which is just really uh, across the start of the fjord here, visitors invited to take a lift then that allows them to experience the feeling of descending beneath the sea's surface to, to enter the underwater realm. All of these exhibitions, and there are others, um, are constructed around the, a logic which is, which is to do, as I said, with the vertical distribution of space and deriving then from the extensive cultural influence of geography of geology rather. Now, that takes us to the idea of the, ge of the geological turn that um, Catherine Youssef, um, Yuri Parika and, and, and others of course have elucidated very fully. This article really takes the idea of the geological turn as its point of departure pursuing connections through tracing the development of extractive seeing, this dominant way of seeing that has its roots in geology and the extractive industries but has, as I say, long since extended its reach beyond the starting point. What I want to do today is to, is to begin to open up uh, an account of extractive seeing and to do so by exploring the training of vision from the industrialization of the extractive process onwards through an examination of visual technologies employed in earth sciences and the extractive industries. It's really following, I suppose, the logic of a, of, a, of a piece of work such as Jonathan Crady's Techniques of the Observer. But Crady, of course, doesn't actually recognize the importance of the extractive industries in training vision in the industrial era. So he's very interested in 19th century training of vision, but not actually the role of the extractive industries there. To focus on extractive seeing is to investigate in detail the nature of the dominant scopic regime that developed in the wake of the Industrial Revolution framing social relations with fossil fuels, simultaneously exerting a much wider cultural and intellectual influence. I thought it might be useful just to, to try to start actually with an example here. Um, an example, some of you may have seen me show this before. This is, this is a piece of artwork. It's a piece of artwork which is produced by the Austrian artist um, Ernst Loga, 
who's been working for the best part of a, of a decade now in um, with, with, with oil and through the oil industries. This was exhibited in, in Aberdeen in, a, in an exhibition there in, in, in Aberdeen's Peacock Visual Arts Gallery. Um, what, what Logar did was he went in search of the hidden locations of the oil industry in order to shed light on them. This piece is called Simulation Room, one of a, of a, of a larger scale um, set of work works in the exhibition. And it's, a, it's, it's one that I chose here because it really focuses on the nature of the geologist's gaze. So in this, in this work, the geologist's gaze, the gaze of the expert with the authority to assemble a visualization, to enjoy the power that such a position confers, is its subject, right? The work shows a 3D model of drilling locations on a seabed projected onto a dark screen. The projection casts a ghostly, you can see this, the ghostly green light back onto a desk holding the projection equipment from which the image on screen emanates. So what we have staged here is an encounter between different kinds of imaging technology, right? between photographic practice and digital production, and between different regimes of looking, that of the artist photographer who's taking the image, whose image is presented here, and that of the geologist, the interpreter of scientific images. Simulation room takes up a perspective that foregrounds the constructedness then of scientific imaging practices and then shows these practices to be embedded in the logic of the hydrocarbon age. The expert gaze, in other words, here is demonstrated to be always already framed by the position of the expert in the oil assemblage. And the visual technologies that produce this gaze are in their very materiality, the projection equipment here at the front, the camera that's producing the image itself, the, 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 um, the ways in which these the, the technical information is assembled and produced for us are also in their very materiality also entirely implicated in the oil assemblage. So what the work does then is draws attention to a reciprocal relationship that exists between visual technology on the one hand and oil exploration on the other. It also shows the connection between the geologist's gaze and that of the artist photographer. And although there's a clear distinction suggested here between these different ways of seeing, both in the end are framed in oil. That's how this was actually presented as, a, as, as an image in the, in the gallery location, so with a, with a frame of oil. Both are framed in oil. And in doing this, then, this shows the connectedness in the social construction of the oil assemblage, their indebtedness to hydrocarbon exploitation, which is the very condition of their existence. So simulation room, this work here, foregrounds visual culture's role in constructing the forms of knowledge that make oil exploration possible, as well as suggesting that the visual culture of oil itself might be training us to see in a particular way. So in microcosm, here's a work that begins to actually open up the very questions that I'm, that, that I'm trying to ask through trying to elucidate the idea of, of, um, of extractive seeing as a concept. To return then to, 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 to reflections on this, in recent years, geology's explanatory power has been invoked across the social and cultural sciences and the arts, the emergence of the Anthropocene as a central or contested concept underpinning a new 21st century grand narrative has given rise to a discernible and, and increasingly well-documented geological term that's been generative of new directions in a range of fields, producing a body of work and activities that Hayden Lorimer and others have dropped, uh, have dubbed the Anthropocene. Um, so contemporary art, building the work of Smiths and others from the 1960s, has embraced geology with enthusiasm over the last decade. You can see that here as well with, 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 with Logar's work, as of other creative practices. What we see if we work with Nixon is that the geological turn is unsettling some of our most profound assumptions about what it means to be human. Well, the central claim of the Anthropocene is that the Earth has entered a new geological age as a result of human activity. The geological turn in the social and cultural sciences has adopted a dual focus, reflecting productively on what the Earth has done to humans as well as on what humans have done to the Earth. Calling on the social sciences to embrace the idea of the geological turn, Catherine Yusuf sets out to examine what the earth does to show social thought. She produces a reading, of, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, a reading of Deleuze through him Cole, which leads her to argue that in staking the epistemological claim of a new geological era, the naming of the Anthropocene enables the necessary reorientations of perception that are required to bring the geosocial into focus. She argues, in, in other words, that the, that the act of renaming, or more 
accurately, I think, proposing to rename the, the, the current geological era, the new strata that it's constructing, provides the catalyst for a reorientation of perception that enables new forms of understanding to emerge. This is the promise of the geological turn that used of and others associate with the emergence of the Anthropocene. What I've been trying to do here with, with, with work that's been looking at extractive seeing and focus on extractive seeing is to offer a partial prehistory of the geological turn, investigating and, and setting out to actually historicize Yusuf's claim that the geological turn enables the construction of new forms of understanding. What I've been trying to argue there is, is that, or, or, or what I've been doing to, to, trying to do is to, just to think through that claim to think through whether or not what we're what we're seeing there is the production of new forms of understanding, or whether what we're actually what we're actually seeing is the production of constrained forms of, of, of understanding. So that's the that that that's the question mark that I've been placing at the end of claims around the geological around the efficacy of the geological turn or the uh, the promise of the geological turn. So. What is, what is extractive seeing? Where, what, 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 what should we make of extractive seeing as a concept? How has earth science trained us to see? How has it aided then the development of the extractive eye? What I've been trying to do as I've been thinking through the, the idea of the extractive, of, of, of extractive seeing, um, picking up on, the, on this question of the geological turn, is to turn to is to, is, is to turn to geological science itself, drawing inspiration from work that examines the relationship between visual culture and the, and the nuclear industry, actually. So Joseph Masco's seminal work on the visual culture of the nuclear industry and um, Kevin, so, sorry, let me just start that one, that sentence again. So extending Masco's seminal work on the visual culture of the nuclear industry, taking inspiration for, from Gallison's extended engagement with X-ray technology, Hamilton and Agorman, so Kevin Hamilton and Ned Agorman, trace the existence of a symbiotic relationship between research and development in photographic technology and in nuclear technology. And by focusing on the history of a particular contractor, eg and key contractor in America's nuclear weapons programming in the Cold War, they've been able to examine the convergence of photographic and ballistic regimes around the existence of what they, what they term the deep media of timing, firing and exposing. So we had Hamilton and Agorman showing how these deep media connections facilitated the construction of a powerful nuclear imaginary generated through the interplay between photographic and nuclear technology that celebrated the highly artificial and technical quality of the nuclear state and its attendant ability to offer a technological solution to the threat of mutually assured destruction. And it seems rather odd to be reading that, rereading that sentence right now. Um, rather than focus on the nuclear mindset here today, however, this article was really looking at an extractivist energy imaginary. So to think about extractivism for a second or two, we will get to this diagram in, in, in a second. Um, Naomi Klein, drawing on a long history of writing relationship to attraction in society, offers a reckoning with what she terms the expansionist extractive mindset, which has so long governed our relationship to nature, maintaining that the global climate crisis calls this way of thinking into question. Gomez Barras, who I, who I cited towards the, the, the beginning of today's talk, offers a more detailed account more recently of the, of the idea of extractivism that frames an absorbing study of the complex social ecologies and alternative ways of seeing that emerge from the work of artists and other cultural producers engaged, engaged with, the Latin, with the extractive zones of Latin America. She writes there in, in her contribution to the extensive literature on Latin American extractive thinking and practices, extractivism references colonial capitalism and its afterlife, extending from its 16th century uh, emergence until the present day. And yet what she argues is that extractivism has assumed a new urgency in recent times through neoliberalism's normalization of the extractive viewpoint. Her focus lies in her analysis of visual responses to extractivism, but she also remains attuned to the visual logic of extractivism itself. Extractive capitalism, she maintains, is based upon a vertical mode of seeing. So we come back to questions of verticality very clearly there. Well, her main concern is to present a compelling set of counter visual resistances to the dominant vertical mode of seeing that she equates with extractivism. What I've been trying to do is to, is to actually go in search of a detailed account of the visual logic of extractivism itself, 
deriving from an analysis of a set of visual technologies related to the process of extraction of fossil fuels that have produced and continue to reproduce extractive seeing. Now, by visual technologies here, what I understand are visualizations of various kinds, as well as the wide variety of tools that have been developed to capture information, which can then subsequently be displayed in visual form. So if we think about the Logar image, for example, we have simulation form, we're thinking about the visual technologies that are on display there, the technologies being not only the equipment and the technologies that are, that are there to produce the image itself, but the, but the image itself as a, as a visual technology. The geological section here, of course, is, uh, is one important visual technology. It's a key graphic element in, not surprisingly, in the, in the oil and gas museum displays in Stavanger, in Aberdeen, in Vienna, and others. Section diagrams um, now form a fundamental part of the visual vocabulary of geology. And so the inclusion in those exhibitions is hardly unexpected. But the question is, how does this come about? How do such diagrams become part of an understandable visual language? That's then where we have recourse to the work of, of Martin Rudwick and right back to work that he, he was undertaking in 1976 already. So in his groundbreaking reflections on the relationship between the history of science and history of producing images, Rudwick argues that it was not until the second decade of the 19th century that technologies section diagram become a standard part of the visual repertoire of geology when the science itself is becoming a self-conscious discipline. So prior to that, we don't see them, them in place. After that, we see them as part of the, 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 the coming to being of a, of a discipline. And by that time, he argues, new forms of visual expression had become an essential part of the development of geology as science. Before that, however, technologies such as this section diagram were employed and developed in the context of the mining industry. So we see the so we see the industrial influencing then the development of the scientific discipline. So such technologies were employed, developed in the context of the mining industry, and Rudwick offers a really wonderful actually overview of geological publications from the late 18th and early 19th centuries as part of his contribution to the history of science, reflecting the production of visual materials, providing information, detailed information on engraving, on printing techniques, and, and other matters here. Um, leading to the development of a coherent visual language of geology. In terms of visual material, he's really interested in two technologies in, in particular, the topological map and the geological section, both of which he maintains and demonstrates are highly theoretical constructs. Both also have their roots in the extractive industries. He's very clear about that argument. The first maps to depict geological information come from mining surveys carried out in France. The earliest geological sections emerge from mining context. This is one such geological section. It comes from actually John Strachey's sections of an English coal field from 1719. Um, similar images were produced by people like uh, Fuchsel and uh, Lehmann in, in Central Europe, 1726 used to communicate information about mining techniques. The development of a geological section, central visual technology and the new discipline of earth science derived from the economic needs of the extractive industries. Mining, Rudwick argues, provided a much more direct incentive to visualize in terms of three dimensional structures than even the most extended ge geographical survey of surface mineral resources. So it's very clear that the, the recourse to mining and the need to drill down, the need to make visible that which is invisible, that actually um, is the impetus towards constructing these um, diagrams and, and therefore developing a new visual language. <clears throat> in detailing the development of a visual language of geology, Rudwick traces the way in which geological sections become more abstract over time, gradually emitting quasi-realistic conventions of representing strata as though they were penetrated by a mine shaft and seeking to represent increasingly complex theoretical propositions. So this one you can see at the top of the screen there, you can see um, trees, representations of trees, representations of the mine shaft. So, so although what we've got here is a relatively um, abstract diagram of the underground of the sub of the subsoil strata, what you've got, of course, is, 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 is also, the, um, is also the, the, the imagery of trees, windmill, um, house, and, and other markers of, um, of scale, um, as well as, as, of, uh, as of a less abstract form of representation. What we increasingly get are the, are the, are the much more abstract um, underground maps. This one was produced in 1809 by Westgard Forster, renders evidence drawn from mines and from surface exposures across the north of England, 
into the form of a single measured columnar section. This was the first of a, of a whole series of correlation diagrams that were to become an essential element then in the visual language of stratigraphical ge geology. Um, and Rudwick argues here that the, the style of depiction was constructed again through the context of the mining industry. This is the, this is the important element here. A fully structural approach to the interpretation of the complex phenomena of geology was most readily attained within a social context of practical mining and mineral surveying by individuals whose familiarity with engineering practice pre-adapted them. And this is the important point in, in Rudwick's argument here, pre-adapted them as it were to the three-dimensional visualizing that structural geology required. In other words, engaging in the activity of mining trains then a particular form of seeing that is then represented through these diagrammatic structures that themselves become ever more abstract. The training is through mining to earth science to a particular way of seeing. It's an important point because it recognizes the agency of the extractive industries, which Roderick maintains here predisposed individuals to produce particular kinds of seeing, to produce particular visual technologies. That's the argument there, it's the predisposition. I think Rudwick's observations here are of importance because they provide clear evidence for development of a discernible visual language of geology that developed the first decades of the 19th century, formalizing practices and conventions that were first used in the extractive industries. More than simply providing compelling evidence of the existence of such a language, Rudwick also offers an indication of the key elements of the way of seeing from which this language developed and to which it then also contributed constructively. He shows how visuals such as sections here became theoretical tools, so not merely as a way of observing, but also as a way of formulating theoretical causal interpretation. He also notes that because of this, extractive seeing was a way of seeing that needed to be trained. Sections, he maintains, are an aspect of visual language of geology which is far removed from straightforward observation and which embodies complex visual conventions that have to be learned by practice, while also suggesting that such training was undertaken not only by the newly differentiated group that come to call themselves geologists, but also, and again importantly, by a wider audience. And there are two facets to that that bear further explication. So first, the more detailed account of the form of extractive seeing that's implied by Rudwick's analysis. And second, the question, this very question of the training of vision, professional and non-professional, which Rudwick on a number of occasions describes as the, as the learning of a new language. His initial engagement with the visual culture of geology only took him up to about 1840, of course. Um, though it's since been followed up with a number of landmark publications looking to the bigger picture of geological advances. But of course, since that time, 1840 onwards, a range of new visual technologies such as photography were developed, which again have a crucial role in constructing the visual culture of oil and therefore of training particular ways of, of seeing. And there are, you know, there are others who are picking up on similar points. I might point also to Eric Nystrom's work on seeing underground, where again, historiographical account of the visual culture of mining in the US, he again argues that the development of mining maps, geological sections, and other kinds of visual technologies brought with them a gradual shift of power of decision making in mining from those who worked below the ground to university trained mining engineers. And these engineers, Nystrom maintains relied upon the visual culture of mining, a set of practices, artifacts, and discourses tied to visualizing underground mines that help render underground mines more predictable. You can see that here, the controllable, more predictable, more controllable, more understandable. So not only then were the, did the images become more abstract, but the practices that they facilitated also do the same. So what does all, all this really mean for extractive seeing. To just shift gears slightly here, the satellites surveying large tracts of the Earth's surface, whether above or below the sea, the drills penetrating the Earth to access oil and gas reserves, the maps of oil fields, the models of oil rigs, the samples of oil, ROVs surveying the seabed, all of these visual technologies are part of the visual culture of oil that renders the deep layers of the Earth apparently predictable, controllable, understandable. Right, so to pick up on that line from, from, from Nystrom there. Although related to the practice of cartography, which routinely sees the surface from an imaginary overhead perspective, extractive seeing, I think, is distinctive in that it's a form of penetrative seeing. It's based on the need to make visible by processes of revelation through locating previously hidden material and bringing it into sight. 
And actually, as I've been pushing forward, and I won't go into that in detail today, but as I've been trying to sort of think about what extractive seeing actually is, it's there's a vertical distribution of space, it's penetrative, but it's also multi-scalar, it's, it's also three-dimensional, it's also to do with a mobilization of vision, and also to do with the idea of subtraction of a, of a, of a, of a form of vision that 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 is that's really embedded in ideas of subtraction as well, and the idea that one can subtract something without that making a difference into, in, in the entity of itself. Let me, let me have her just follow a different line of thinking here for a second or two. So the process of, the, the process of, of making visible um, constructs a particular relationship to the earth. Um, this process of making visible, of making visible that which lies beneath, of making visible oil, gas, coal reserves, constructs a particular relationship to the earth, which involves imagining nature as a, as a reservoir of resources. In the modern period, pick up with Heidegger, for example, Heidegger, nature Heidegger, Heidegger ma maintains becomes a gigantic gasoline station, an energy source for modern technology and industry. These resources, according to the imaginary constructed by extractive seeing, are, are regarded as isolated entities that can be extracted from the ecosystem without consequence. Extractive seeing, therefore, is a looking practice that makes visible the invisible in order to render it mobile. It enables expansion through capitalist expansion, through opening up particular resource frontiers, through making it accessible through processes of visualization, such as the way that, the grav that a gravity map, for example, of the Earth is, is prized for its ability to make the, the Arctic accessible. So we think about visual technologies now, we're thinking of the visual technologies here from, from, the, from, the 18, from, the 18, from about 1809, but we're also thinking about the impact that those have on the kinds of visual, visual technologies that enable then um, opening up accessibility of, of various resource frontiers. So oil, is the, the argument is, but fuels a particular scopic regime. It's a regime based on extractive seeing that inscribes a narrative of control over the natural environment, renders it controllable, understandable, um, and supports the extraction of value from natural resources through the deployment of, of a range of visual technologies. It does this while removing from spectators, us, us, those who are using these technologies, any responsibility for offering a critical response to these ideas through the operation of what someone like Ariela Azule calls the reification of visible, which relates to the authority invested in the person capturing images, or more pertinently here, in the apparent neutrality of the instrument or the apparent neutrality of the visual technology. So extractive seeing goes beyond simply a relationship to fossil fuels to encompass a whole way of thinking which is connected to the centrality of the idea of making visible as a method. And making visible as a method, and here's, here's my last slightly speculative point, and some of you have heard me sort of, you know, say this before, um, making visible as, as a method in a range of, of disciplines, not merely in the natural sciences. I, think with Nadia Bozak in her reflections on the relationship between cinema and fossil fuels, she alludes to the emancipatory promise of making visible when reflecting on the challenges of petroculture. The question now is whether that technology produces a solution to the ecological, social and political problems of extraction based culture by making them visible. So here you, you see someone who is inured to the idea of the potential of making visible, but of course the whole the whole the whole promise of making visible is already tied up with the very technologies that 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 you're seeking to criticize the desire to make visible underpins the documentary form which is under discussion in Bozak's work more than that it's also the fundamental methodological assumption that lies at the heart of critical analysis in in much of the work that we undertake right in the, in the humanities and the social sciences which seek to reveal that which remains hidden in the text that which be, remains hidden the visual object and just to give you a sense of some, some of my coordinates that I'm thinking here of Marx's memorable description of ideology in terms of the sentimental veil being torn away from the family by the bourgeoisie, Zumo's use of the metaphor of dropping a plumb line from the surface, from the surface level manifestations of all kinds to reveal their underlying metaphysical realities, which he does in Metropolis and, and Mental Life. I'm thinking about, however, also the, the, some of the key assumptions in the development of psychiatry and the way in which that works its, its way out in, 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 the, in the form of critical thinking. 
um, in something like Walter Benjamin's concept of the optical unconscious, which draws on psychoanalysis to argue for film's ability to reveal the absolute which is imminent to experience, but which manifests itself in inconspicuous and indirect ways. Humanities scholarship then is drawing on the metaphor, I think, often of drilling down to access the deep knowledges, knowledge that exists beneath the surface of the object under investigation, and in doing so is engaged in a process that is shaped by extractive seeing. This then is part of the method, part of the epistemological foundation of the disciplines themselves. It's about the existence of deep knowledge, it's about the wherewithal to, to access it. The methods that we utilize are potentially methods that we have been trained to use through training in a particular way of seeing that we might trace right back to the mining industry and the way in which the mining industry then gives rise to geological science, which gives rise to a very particular form of vocabulary, which gives rise to a very particular way of thinking. What does this mean? It means being attentive to the pervasive nature of extractive seeing means understanding that, the, from my perspective, that the visual record available to me to write and to assess Europe's oil history, which is what I'm interested in, was filtered through extractive seeing in its construction, and again, actually, in its interpretation, whether that interpretation is in the construction of the exhibition, where I started this, or in the critical response to that exhibition, what I'm offering. If, I'm, if we're interested in thinking through, which I am, low carbon futures, then that also means beginning to look for forms of representation and forms of interpretation that are at the very least attentive to extractive seeing as a concept, as a framing device, as something which trains us to think in particular ways, not only to see in particular ways, but to think in particular ways, and at best then to begin to offer alternatives to this dominant looking practice. As I say, apologies. <laughs> Thank you very much. I um, we, we will take two minutes to uh, gather our thoughts, and I'm going to place some bottles of wine here. Um, I thought you might uh, appreciate <laughs> some relief. Yeah, they're not all for you, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, unless I mean, obviously. <laughs> Extractive, yes, extractive practices. I shall drill down into the core. Oh, excellent. You see, even open the bottle of wine. Exactly. So we have the Would let me in. Where were you? Um, would people like to help themselves? Janet, would you like something? I would. Too. Thank you very much. So, it's not going to work. Um, you're welcome to help yourselves. <laughs> Why is that so? Uh, Peter, are you there? 
Yeah. yeah. Now you see what I meant uh, this morning. <laughs> we are missing all the fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, you win some, lose some. Can you still see and hear us? Cheers, Peter. Yes, cheers, cheers. En enjoy. <laughs> have, have one for me and Gianluca. <laughs> Somewhere a little more. Good. Okay, I've got this here so I can see the online questions. Oh, somebody just said cheers. <laughs> All right. Um, good. Well, thank you very much, Janet. Um, questions and comments? Sorry. Yes, Joe. Uh, so I have a, a very abstract question, um, harkening back to your, your uh, mention of trying to figure out whether or not the, the geological turn is a new way of thinking or a new way. Um, because it seems to me that constraints often are new ways of thinking, or constitute new ways of thinking, right? So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, special relativity, right, is about imposing certain constraints that, that are, you know, the three rational lights that want a visual culture. Um, so, I mean, it seems like it might be able to rephrase the question in terms of whether or not the constraints being chosen are the appropriate ones to encourage the right forms of thinking. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious if you put the question in those terms, like what precisely are your issues with the term? What sort of constraints do you think would be more productive for talking about the sorts of issues you want to highlight? Yeah, that's really, that's a really useful question, Joe. Um, so I think the starting point for my considerations was uh, an understanding of, of, of the concept of the geological turn as, uh, as something which 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 in, which enables uh, the, the promise of emancipatory forms of thinking, and within that, 